A little bit. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Elevate Church family. All right. Y'all are the 1130. You're supposed to be awake. Nope. All right. That's cool. That's a... Hey, there's one. All right. That's okay. Hey, if you if you first time here, yes, we do have fun in church. Uh, fun is one of our values, and uh, laughter does good like medicine. So let's laugh a little and get healed and get get cured from our ailments. Amen. Um, I'm excited today. Uh, as if you were here last week, uh, we talked about what was Jesus doing leading up to this day, 2,000 plus years ago, leading up to his death and resurrection. Uh, and we talked through that. And if you remember in the beginning of it, uh, I talked about how I mentioned that I had some breakthrough, that I had gotten clarity with the Lord. You know, I don't know if you've ever been there, but where you're praying and you don't sense anything, you don't see prayers answered, whatever it may be. We go through these ups and downs, mountains and valleys as believers, right? You're like, Lord, can you hear me, right? But I felt this click in and I really felt clearly the Lord speak to me. I don't know if you remember me talking about that last week. And I said that he gave me some direction and that I was excited to share with you uh, what that is and what that looked like. And, and there's a lot to it. There really is a lot to it. And that's going to continue on as we press forward as, as the family of God together. But today's message is part of that, that clarity that, that I felt that I got with the Lord last week. And so those of you that were here last year, one year ago on Palm Sunday, some of today's message might sound familiar, right? And, and I was planning one way, uh, but the Lord very clearly directed me back to this message from last year. And, and, and there's definitely been some additions and refinement, um, but this is very similar to, not very similar, similar to last year's Palm Sunday message. And I want to tell you that, that when I say that there was breakthrough and there was clarity, there was breakthrough and clarity. And I was stirred up and I was encouraged. And the Lord talked about us being a body of Christ, needing to be more bold in this world. And he said, you need to stir people up. You need to remind them of this message. So when I say that the Lord brought me back to this message, I didn't want to do it, but the Lord brought me back to this this message. And, and again, I prayed about it, refined it. And I believe that the Lord is very clearly speaking to us to make a very important point. So please lean in as we press in. You with me? Yes. And if you're here last year, don't ruin it for everyone else. Okay. All right. So again, today, as we know, today's Palm Sunday, uh, and it's a lead in to Holy Week as most of us uh, know. And what I remember as a kid, Palm Sunday at church was that we had palm leaves handed out at the door and we always ended up making crosses out of them by the end of the day, right? And we had those crosses. Sometimes we did sword fighting and hit each other over the head during mass uh, with those palm leaves, right? Um, and I, I, that is something that I remember about Palm Sunday. And I would say that I sort of knew the meaning, but it mostly just meant to me that I could look forward to candy and spring break, right? Candy and spring break. If you're with me when you're a kid, I don't know. But, but uh, let's talk about Cadbury eggs again. No? St- nobody, still nobody brought me one, but that's okay. We'll see. Uh, no, that's okay. I'll, I'll, nobody, nobody cares. I'm just kidding. Uh, jelly beans and Cadbury eggs. So, um, <laughs> so I would like to bring a little context to Palm Sunday as we talk through the Word of God today. Uh, many of us know that pa- where, where, the, where the term... Palm Sunday came, th- uh, came from, and so I really want to give it context, and we're going to talk through it. Before we get into the Word, we are known as a church that prays too much, and I like that reputation, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, so much that your joy truly has preceded us in this place today, Lord, and I thank you that your Word says the joy of the Lord is our strength, Lord, so thank you for strengthening us with your joy, Lord. I thank you that your Word truly is living and active. Thank you, Lord, that it never returns void, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us as your children, Lord. We lean in today, we turn our hearts toward you, and we ask you to speak a word in season as we lean in and listen to you and, and ask for your guidance today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. All right, so like I said, many of us know that, that, that in this time, Jesus is processing into Jerusalem, and that's where we get Palm Sunday, and we'll talk through that. And, and this is during Passover that he's processing into Jerusalem and, and the people at that time begin to throw their coats down and palm leaves down as he rode into the city. And some of us also know that this was one of the many times during Jesus' ministry, during his 33 years on this earth, that prophecy was being fulfilled, right? Right before their very eyes. And we read about one of those prophecies in Zechariah 9, verse 9. And verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, 
a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here we have 450 to 500 years prior to Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. The prophet Zechariah had already prophesied the event that was unfolding before their eyes at that time. And that is the event that we now call Palm Sunday where we are celebrating today. And if you know uh, that song, Hosanna, that we just sang, ha- very much has meaning because they were saying Hosanna. And, that, and Hosanna sa- means save now, please save us. Salvation is here. Thank you. It means all those things. So when we're singing Hosanna, it's not just a Christianese term that we've heard in church. It means save now. Like they were declaring, thank you, Lord, for salvation because it's right in front of our eyes. And that's, so, that's why we sing that song Hosanna. And we can read about that in Matthew 21, verse 9. It says, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And in a minute, we're going to uh, read through Luke's account of what happened on that Palm Sunday and, and Jesus processing into the city on that first Palm Sunday. And you can find that in Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 28, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to them. Um, To prepare yourself, put a pen there, your finger there, your marker there, whatever it may be. But first, before we read through that, I want to draw your attentions to the screen. And I want to show you this this little video to see if any of us can relate to something here. Oh, I, yeah. Hey, texting and walking. Whoop. Oh, no. That was... I think you had guardian angel, and so did she. <laughs> I know I've done this. I mean, I, I <laughs> if you didn't, then I don't know. This guy I feel bad for here. Oh, that one hurt. Another one. We'll pray for him. Oh, don't text and walk downstairs. There's a banana peel right there. Uh, no. Oh, there she goes in the door. This. Ooh. Ah. This one, oh my goodness. In Jesus' name, she was okay. All right, that's, that's good. Wow. Now, okay, can you relate? No? Ever been there texting and walking on the phone, running in? Wow, you guys are just really good at texting and walking. Are you as good at as texting and driving? No. Oh, good. Okay, we shouldn't be doing that, right? <laughs> How many of us can relate, really? Like, can you relate to that, right? Right. When we're not paying attention, we can miss it. A door, a lake, a hole, right? And sometimes, by the looks of that, it can be very painful. Amen? And so, the message title today is, Don't Miss It. Don't Miss It. Don't Miss It. So let's get into the Word, and we're going to read from Luke 19, and we'll start in verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus, you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Okay, this is the only time that theft was okay. okay. So don't follow in the footsteps. All right. So those who were sent went their way and they found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the others of it, I'm sorry, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, just as obediently, they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw out their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, that if these should keep silence, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as we drew near to him, I'm sorry, as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. 
For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. They didn't know the time of the visitation. So we're going to kind of dissect this and walk through this passage of Scripture. And I have a little bit of a description with some reflection points on this passage that I want to talk through with you first, and then we'll really get into it. So um, let's talk about what we just read. Uh, We just read the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, right? And this event marks the beginning of, like I said, what we now call Holy Week, right? It's a time when Christians around the world remember and reflect on the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus enters Jerusalem, the crowds are welcoming him with joy. They're, they're praising him. They're shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And they lay down their cloaks. They lay down their palm branches where we get Palm Sunday from, right? A symbol of victory and triumph at his feet. However, as we just read, Jesus knows that his entry into Jerusalem is not the kind of triumph that the people expect. He knows that he's on his way to the cross where he will suffer and die for the sins of humanity. And as we reflect on this scripture, we can learn several important lessons. I have three of them. The first one is we can see the importance of recognizing Jesus, our King and Savior. We must acknowledge him as the one who comes in the name of the Lord, just like they shouted, and place our trust in him. Second, we see the importance of humility, right? Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey. It wasn't a grand horse or a chariot, but a humble donkey. He does not seek earthly power or glory, but he rather chooses to serve and sacrifice for others. And lastly, we can see the importance of perseverance, right? Jesus knew his path. He knew that his path would lead to suffering and would lead to death, but he continued on anyway, trusting in God the Father's plan. As we face challenges and difficulties in our own lives, we must also persevere, trusting in God's plan and purpose for us. So let us use this Holy Week as we enter in as a time to reflect on Jesus' sacrifice, maybe to rededicate ourselves to following Him. May we recognize Him as our King, embrace humility, and persevere in our faith. Amen? Amen. And, and, and everything that I just read, I just read kind of a little description with some, some points um, that I spoke to you there those past couple of minutes. That's totally biblical, right? That's scripturally sound. Um, there were probably some takeaways for you. Maybe made you feel pretty good about the season we're in right now for a minute. Uh, and it was something that you might expect to hear from a sermon on, any given, on, on Palm Sunday on any town, USA, at a Christian church in that town, right? It might be what you would expect to hear on Palm Sunday. And for those of you that have been going to church for a long time, it might be exactly what you thought to hear. You're like, oh, they're going to read about the procession. They're going to talk through that. Um, or something similar, right? You came... You're expecting that that's what you might hear. Well, the interesting thing about what I just read, that little sermonette and that description of Luke 19, is that I didn't write it. As a matter of fact, no human wrote it. That was, transact- that was transcribed by artificial intelligence, AI. And it's, it's, it's true. Has anyone ever heard of uh, chat GPT? You heard some of you have, right? There's a lot of talk of it, uh, of ChatGPT and other AI projects right now that are growing. Technology is, is improving very fast. And so I went to this website called OpenAI. I started an account, and I typed in the chat bot real quick. Write a short sermon on Luke 19, 28 through 44. And that's what it spit out. Just boom, starts transcribing it immediately. Biblically sound, scripturally sound, all pulled from the internet, right? And I probably could have used this sermon today. Maybe you had the AI bot make it a little longer so that it would last the whole service. And we could have all gone home or gone out to lunch and been like, all right, that was a great sermon. Praise the Lord. Get on with our day. And regardless of whether you think the implementation of AI for certain things is good or not, what's wrong with using AI for my sermons? It's all accurate, right? It's pulled from biblical text through the Internet. Well, what's, it's wrong on so many levels. But for the purpose of this example, it's artificial. The Holy Spirit is not at work in that work. The Holy Spirit did not lead me to write or type any of those words. If I would have kept that message as my message for Palm Sunday, it would have been me being led by my own flesh, 
my own desire to take the easy way out, to be lazy and not seek the Lord and what he has to speak to us today. And this is an example, family, of how easy it is in this day and age to be manipulated and led away from the Lord. If we are not paying attention, we might miss it, just like they did in Jerusalem that Palm Sunday. Now, this message sounded like what we would expect to hear on Palm Sunday, right? You might have expected to hear that passage. And imagine if we just let AI just keep on writing sermons. Who knows at what point that that bot would start to tweak things, change things, move things around, make it its own, making those who are not paying attention believe something completely contrary to the Word of God. And we would miss it right before our very eyes. Especially in today's day and age, family, it seems like people are able to be manipulated so easily. Don't miss it. Another example of this, and I'm going to show a picture on the screen in just a minute. But, um, and if you've seen this before, then please don't ruin it for the person next to you. But will y'all play along with me? <clears throat> okay, nobody's going to. That's okay. Um, how about you guys? Front row, we're good? Okay, good. Brian? All right. So go ahead and put that picture up. <laughs> all right. So on, on the screen, we have um, two circles. We have a red circle and a blue circle, right? And contrary to what you might believe or see, those are not the same size, those two circles there. And so what we're going to do, we're going to determine which one is bigger, the red circle or the blue circle. So really quickly, if you would, by a raise of hands, if you think that the blue circle is the bigger one, just go ahead and raise your hand. If you're feeling the blue circle is the one that's bigger, okay? If you, red circle, if you feel like the red circle is the bigger one, then go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, so a little more blue than red, but pretty even throughout the sanctuary. Uh, Brian, when you first saw that picture... What was your first instinct about those two circles? Same size, yeah? So your instinct was that they were the same size, right? Well, the reason why they look the same size is because they are the same size, right? But I just got a bunch of you to say that you believed that one was bigger than the other by a quick raise of hands, just like that. We can be manipulated very easily to believe something that goes against our natural instincts, family. Imagine as a child if you were taught that the red circle is bigger your whole life as a young child, right? You, if, if you're taught the lie enough times, it becomes part of your reality. If enough people are taught that lie, it becomes part of culture. And if that gets passed on generation to generation, it becomes tradition. And it gets further and further from the truth. We've seen some of that in today's day and age, amen? Listen, the family of your, the, sorry, the enemy of your soul wants to continue getting us to believe enough lies, enough times that they get passed on to the next generation and become part of culture, creating so much confusion that we forget about who the real true God is. Like that. That's his plan. Now, a minute ago, I said that we can be manipulated to believe something that goes against our natural instincts, right? That's why we need supernatural instincts, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. That's why we need to be leaning into him. That's why we need to be in the word of God, in fellowship with the brethren, in prayer, in relationship, communion with the Father, because the Holy Spirit will enable you to see through a red and blue circle. Amen? Amen? So let's go back to Luke, if you will, Luke 19. And there's an important part of this, this passage that, that I want us to reflect on. Verse 41 talks about how Jesus drew near to the city, and he saw the city. And he's looking out over Jerusalem to praises, and people laying their clothes down and, and, and palms on the ground, and, which means victoria, which, which, excuse me, which symbolizes victory. And there, there's all this going on, praising him, and he's weeping. It says that he wept, right? And he says, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. He's saying it's right here in front of you, everything you've been asking. But now they are hidden from your eyes. And he goes on to talk about the enemy in verse 43. For days will come. Upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And what does it say? They will not leave in you one stone upon another because why? You did not know the time of your visitation. 
The NLT translation says, because you did not recognize it when God visited you. They missed it. God's people missed it. And if you continue on a couple of chapters into Luke 22, a couple pages over, verse 66 says this, As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him to or into their council. Now it's interesting, I forgot to mention this, but the title of that says, you can find it in my Bible, Jesus faces a Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin are the religious teachers of that time. They fa- those are the people that are supposed to be on his team, right? And verse 67 says, um, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Verse 69, Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. And they said, they all said, are you the son of God? So he said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. They said, all right, you said it. You're the son of man. And they said, what? Oh, awesome. Praise the Lord. Beautiful. I'm so glad you're here. No, they said blasphemy. All the prophecies they've been reading and studying and speaking and teaching have been unfolding before their very eyes. It's right in front of their face. He says it to them. You have rightfully said, I am the Son of God. And I will sit in power next to the Father. And they say, blasphemy. They missed it. It was right in front of their face. The prophecy was fulfilled in every single detail. And it was indeed a time of rejoicing as Jerusalem welcomed their king, right? Unfortunately... The celebration didn't last very long, right? And the crowds, the crowds we know, they looked for a Messiah who would rescue them politically and free them nationally. But Jesus, he came to save them spiritually. Jesus' plan is always first things first. He wants to get the first things first done. And he knows that, that mankind's primary need is spiritual salvation, not political, cultural, or national salvation. Spiritual salvation. And this was not what the people had expected, right? This is not what the people expected. The new kingdom rule that they had been hearing about, reading about, listening to their whole life would look like. They were ready to see God come in and just take out the Romans. Take out the Roman rule. Get rid of the Roman oppression that had been on their people for so long. They thought that's what it would look like when the king rode in. But God had other plans. This was not God's plan. He was actually bringing the peace that they had been crying out for, but it was on such a higher level that they could never, they could ever fathom, and a majority of them missed it. And 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 family, this is parallel to our lives in so many ways. We get so caught up in what we expect life to look like, and we're like, "This is nothing what I thought it would look like," so I have to change it right now. Right? We try to do our will instead of his will. And we miss it. We say, this is not what I expected. This is not what I expected my marriage to look like. This is not what I expected married life to look like. This is not what I expected this job to look like. I didn't get the title or the promotion or the recognition. I'm not earning the money. I'm not getting the hours. I don't have the retirement plan. None of it's what I expected. We do it with church and ministry as well, right? This is not the church I expected it to be. This ministry isn't what I expected. This worship is definitely not what I expected. These people are crazy at Elevate Church, right? This message is not what I expected. This guy's yelling at me. Right? These people in church, that's not what I expected. People keep giving me hugs. Why are they so nice? That's not what I expected in church. Right? I didn't get the title in ministry that I was expecting. I didn't get the recognition that I deserve serving in ministry. I didn't get the promotion into the title that I deserve. It's not what I expected. It's not what I expected my children to look like or be like. This is not what I expected life with children to be like. (laughs) Amen, parents? On that first Palm Sunday, 
Even as the multitudes waved the palm branches and shouted for joy, they missed the true reason for Jesus' presence. They could neither see nor understand the cross. And that's why as Jesus approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, it says that he wept over it. And he said, if you had known, even you especially, in this your day, the things that make for your peace, they had been crying out for peace. And the one bringing the peace was right in front of their very faces. And they missed the thing to see the Savior, but not recognize him for who he is. The same crowds who were crying out, Hosanna, on Palm Sunday, were crying out, crucify him, later that same week. How many times have we sung Hosanna in church, or right? Or I was made to be tending a grave, I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. Do you believe that? You were born and raised back to life again. And we, amen, and we sing it on Sunday. By the time Wednesday comes around, maybe we're not saying crucify him, but we definitely just set him aside because our world is too complicated for God. Let me tell you something. Nothing is too complicated for him. I mean, do you really think that there's anything too big for the one who created it all? Think about this. How long have you been in church? Five minutes? Five years? 25 years? What have you been reading? What messages have you been listening to? Watching? What have you been listening to? Do you believe all of it? Do we believe that he created all? Then is anything too complicated or too big for him? How can it be? No. Nothing is too complicated for God. But we have to bring it to him. We have to lay it at his feet. Amen? We got to take a step. There's a little bit of effort in it. God is trying to bring renewal to your life. He's trying to bring revival to your life, right? Maybe it's right in front of your very face and you're missing it because it doesn't look like what you thought it was going to look like. We read this Palm Sunday account of Jesus' life in the Gospels and so many, so many people in that time, especially the religious and the religious teachers we read about, like we just read in Luke 19, and we see them and we read through it. Maybe you watch The Chosen and you get a visual of it too, right? And you, and you see them and they miss their Savior right before their very face. And in our minds, we're like, hey, you idiot, don't you see this? He's right there. Could you not see prophecy after prophecy unfolding before your very eyes? But we might be in that very same situation in our own lives right now. Are we missing it just because it doesn't look like what we expected it to look like? I encourage you, family of God, seek the Lord and ask him to remove whatever it is that's causing you to miss it. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to put distraction after distraction, put cloud before your eyes, the veil that needs to be torn so you can see what it is that God is showing you. Because listen, we always say, Lord, speak to me, speak to me, speak to me. He's always speaking. He's always leading. He's always guiding. It's a matter of whether we see it or not. And I am encouraged today, and I want to encourage you, family of God, don't miss it. Don't miss it. And what does that mean practically in my life? It's like a job situation, for example. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but how many of you hate your job, right? I'm quitting. This is too tough. My job sucks. Well, maybe Jesus has a plan for you right there in that job. Maybe he has a certain person, a certain someone for you to reach by revealing to them what God is doing in your life. Maybe you have a lesson to learn in that very job until he releases you to the next. Or maybe he's already released you a long time ago. He's encouraged you to step out in faith, but you're hanging on to that job in fear because of job security. Don't miss it. A lot of students in here. With school, many of us look back at school and have OCD like me. But anyway, not OCD, PTSD, one of those Ds. <laughs> Definitely was not OCD in school. I loved Bible college, all the rest of it I didn't. Thank you, Jesus, for changing my heart. But I know there's a lot of students in here. You might be in, in, in college at the university or in a, in a trade school or in high school, whatever it may be, and you're like, this is not what I expected it to look like. This is not what I, I thought I'd be partying the whole time in college. What is all this work? What is all of this? What is this? St. George, Utah. What, this is not what I thought it would look like. 
This teacher is not what I had in junior college. I had this, I think it was calculus, math teacher. And she had a very thick foreign accent. And she was a short woman. And she never turned around. And she would be like, blah, 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 like this on the board. And I'm like, how in the world am I going to learn anything here? This is not what I expected college to look like, right? Well, maybe you're trying to do all of it on your own instead of inviting him into it. The Bible says that we have the mind of Christ, that we've not been given the spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. So as a child of God, as a son or daughter of God, you can overcome that, but you have to bring it to him. I know that's hard as a student. There's a lot of pressure on you, but you got to bring it to him. In marriage, I give up. She's impossible. (laughs) Right? You ever said that? No, I've never said that, babe. I love you. For me, it's always pride stubbornness. If we fight, if we get into an argument and any amount of time goes by before we make up, it's pride. It's my pride that didn't allow me to stop, take a beat and talk it through. Right? Amen. 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 But I'll tell you what, husbands, wives, don't miss the opportunity for growth through grace and love. Love is a weapon. Use it. Use it in your marriage. Use it in your relationships. Amen. Moving. Oh, we all have a habit of doing this. Life is too difficult here. I'm out. See ya. I'm moving. Family, maybe he's trying to refine you and teach you so you can thrive right here where you are. Maybe you're called to the city. Maybe you're not. On the other hand, look, if it's his will, please follow the will of God, but know his will. If the Lord is leading you, if the Holy Spirit is leading you to move somewhere else, awesome. But if you're just moving to get away from difficulty, I I can tell you that's probably not not the right step. But if you're following the lead in the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to stop you. Move to Timbuktu. If that's what God is telling you to do, just make sure you're in the will of God. Amen? Our health. We talked about this last week. We have to bring it to His feet, right? So many of us are in the habit of just Eh, the diagnosis is what it is. Oh, well, the world says to do this. The doctor says to do that. Everybody says to do this. This is what I'm going to do. Well, guess what? We serve the great physician. We have to bring it to the feet of Jesus, family. His promise is that your healing shall spring forth speedily, that you are the healed of the Lord. The Bible says that by his stripes you are healed. But you got to bring it to him, family. Amen? Amen. Your healing is yours. On that clap in there. Hallelujah. Leaving the church. It's quiet up in here. Wow. This person said this. That person said that. Over at Elevate Church, they're too teachy, too preachy. It's too cold in the sanctuary. It's too hot in the sanctuary. They don't have enough programs. The chairs are too big. The chairs are too small. I don't like the red color, right? Whatever it may be. I'm just going to go to that church because the music's better, because the chairs are in better color, because uh, they have a better kids program, because they have a better youth program, because the pastor preaches better, whatever it may be. Stop. Take a beat. What did he say about your current situation? What is the Holy Spirit leading you? Does he want you here? Does he want you in your job? Does he want you in your marriage? I'm going to say probably, right? You have to lean in, family. We can't miss it. The Lord is consistently guiding us. Whatever it may be. Too much of this or too much of that, not enough of this, not enough of that. That's the result of you, not al- or of you allowing the noise of your worldly circumstances to speak louder than the truth of the Word of God. That's the result of whatever you're feeding on, whatever you're putting in, surfacing. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? If you're not being filled by putting His Word in you, If you're not filling your time with relationship with God in prayer, if you're not filling your time with fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ, what's going to come out of you is your flesh. Amen. What's going to come out of you are the worldly things that you keep putting in, that you keep watching, that you keep listening to, that is manipulating you away from the truth of what God has for you in your life. That is what's going to surface. Your inflow, what you put in, it needs to be Him. So that you can operate out of the overflow of the goodness of God in you. 
Imagine if all of us in here were operating out of the overflow of what we were putting in. I would say miracles, signs and wonders, hundreds, thousands coming to Christ. This city changed, this state changed, this nation changed for him, right? If we were all operating out of the overflow, come on somebody, that would be a place to walk out. So family, as we prepare for Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, and, and we reflect on what a gift, what a gift it is. That Jesus died for our sins. And he rose from the dead, conquering death, hell, and the grave so that we could live in eternity with him. Let's make sure that we are in the will of God. Don't miss it. We don't want our Lord Jesus weeping for us because we missed the very thing that was going to bring us the peace that we've been praying for, the joy that we've been seeking, the, 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 the rescue out of what seems like an impossible situation. Listen, there's a very clear separation happening in the world right now. A major transition spiritually. On one hand, evil is more prevalent than I've ever seen in my lifetime, and you can probably all agree with me. What is good, what is, good is being called evil. What is evil is being called good. Right? A lot of that going on. On the other hand, we have revival being stirred up in many places nationwide and worldwide, right? Yes. Yeah. And guess what, fam? If you didn't know, this is an election year. <laughs> oh, here's a pastor going to talk about politics, man. <laughs> this is an election year. We know we've been lied to about a lot of things over the past four years, but guess what? It's been going on a lot longer than that. Yeah. I'll tell you an uncomfortable truth. Politically, I don't trust either side. I don't believe that either side has our best interests at heart. There's definitely a situation one's a better leader than the other. But ultimately, it doesn't matter because Jesus is still on the throne. Amen? And, and if, we don't, if we don't miss it, if we don't miss what he's telling us, what he's showing us, what he's leading us into and or away from through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will thrive regardless. We will rise regardless. doesn't matter who the president is, who the governor is, who the senator is. It doesn't matter because he is still on the throne and he will make a way for his remnant church. Amen? So we are in a major transition spiritually. We are in a spiritual battle. This is not something that is often talked about in the church, but it needs to be known and it needs to be said. We are in a spiritual battle. The minute you came to Christ and you said, I accept you as my Lord and Savior, I turn away from my old life and I turn towards you, you did not just get to reap the benefits of, of, of salvation. Of course you did, absolutely. You can sit around and do that, by all means. But you were called into an army. You were called to arm up. You were called to gird your loins with the belt of truth. I, I put upon my feet the, uh, the preparation of the gospel of peace, the, right, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. Above all, the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, the sword of the spirit, sharper than any two-edged sword, which is the word of God. That we are supposed to arm up daily because we're called to spiritual warfare, family. We are in a battle, and it's more obvious than it ever has been, at least, or my eyes are just open. We are in a major transition spiritually. We are in a spiritual battle. And I believe the warfare is over the gates of our eyes, the eye gate, and in our ears. What are you watching? What are you looking at? What are you listening to? Our eyes are the windows to the soul. Right now, there's mass propaganda so that we won't see what's really going on in the spirit realm. Mass propaganda politically, in business, in the media, whatever it may be, it's blanketed, right? Satan always creates illusions that create confusion. That's just what he does from the beginning of time. We talked about AI. This technology is advancing very rapidly, right? Pictures, videos, voices can all be altered. They can make you look like you were somewhere you where you never were, saying things that you never said. That's happening now. The confusion is to get you to forget who you are in Christ, to get you to miss it. The media's job, family, is to distract us from the truth, not to report the truth. I'm just telling you that. That's the truth. <laughs> they get obsessed with celebrities, celebrity lifestyle. They get obsessed with politics, and we get pulled right in, just like the red dot is bigger than the blue dot. And the enemy wants us consuming. The enemy wants us mindlessly scrolling trying to keep ourselves full, trying to keep ourselves entertained, 
trying to keep us to go along with whatever the world is doing. To distract us what God has right in front of our very face. While everyone is sheepishly, sheepishly consuming, as children of God, as daughters, as sons of God, we are called and we are supposed to be producing, not consuming. There are things happening all around us, family. Leaders are falling. Other leaders are rising. It's happening. There's a transition happening. We are alive today for such a time as this. We, were, we are created for this right now. We were plucked out of eternity and placed right here for such a time as this. Not to stand as, as believers who have salvation and say, Lord Jesus, come quick. Take me now, right? That's not what we're called to do. That is, the, that is what's going to happen in the end of the day. That's not what we're called to do. We're created for more. We're made for more, not to sit on TikTok all day and scroll, not to sit on Instagram all day and scroll through and consume. We are called to produce as citizens of heaven. Amen. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. What are we called to do as the church, as the body of Christ in a time like this? Do we believe that we're called for a purpose? Amen. For such a time as this, amen, as believers, as the body of Christ, we are. And revival, revival starts here. Revival starts in our heart. Worship team, you guys can come up. We have to take a moment. What a beautiful time, too, the beginning of Holy Week. If we want revival like we say we want, if we want to know the truth when all these lies are being thrown in our face, it starts here. I don't, I don't want us to forget that the word that was given Elevate Church, the body of Christ here in this family, was break up your fallow ground. Search inward for the areas of your heart that have been hardened and soften your heart towards the Lord because he's ready to reveal the truth to us. But you've got to have a softened heart toward the Lord to know what it is. We, we, we have to be in a constant state of communion with God. We have to be really tuning in to the Holy Spirit as the lies and distractions are increasing. If you are in tune with the Holy Spirit, with the gift of discernment, you will know the truth and you will know the lies. Think about this. If you know the story of Joseph, imagine if Joseph missed it. If he didn't give grace to his brothers who sold him into slavery when they were starving and came back to Egypt to get food. If he wouldn't have given them grace at that moment, his brother Judah would have died. I don't know if you heard of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah, that line goes all the way to Jesus. Imagine if Joseph missed it. Imagine if Noah missed it. Y'all know the story of Noah's ark. Imagine if he hadn't listened to God and, and built the ark. Would humanity have survived? Would humanity have been wiped out? I mean, I believe that, that God would have would have used another person, maybe Brian, right? We wouldn't have been talking about Noah. We'd be talking about Brian. So if you've got to build an ark, please let us know, all right? If the Lord tells you, we're going to Brian's house, amen? Please don't start building an ark, Brian. Okay. <laughs> but imagine if Noah had missed it. And I say all of this, family, we, we go through all this. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing in on this point because family of God, God made it very clear to me to say to you and to me, don't miss it. Don't miss it. He's here. He's with you. He's calling on you. He has the answers you've been looking for. He is the one who will bring all things hidden into light. Don't miss it. And we all have one thing. Some of us have many things that are leading us to take our eyes off of Him. That are leading us to away from understanding his will for our lives. Things that are blinding us from his very path that he has for us. So I'm asking you today, Elevate Church, what is that thing? If you know, you know. If you don't know, ask him. Yeah. He'll reveal to you. He'll show you what that thing is. The, the, the religious teachers of Jesus' time, they knew the scriptures. They had been reading them and studying them again and teaching them their whole lives. They saw prophecy unfolding before their very eyes. But they didn't know when their Savior was right in front of their face. They missed it. Think about that. 
Really think about that. They had been reading it and studying it. They had read the prophet. They had read the script already. They're in the movie. They read the script. The part is there right in front of their face and they missed it. The people of God, the, the Israelites shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. One day in celebration and then a few days later, they just went what everyone else was, went with what everyone else was doing. Praise the Lord. The power of the Holy Spirit has hit Angelo. And he doesn't need batteries in his microphone anymore. God has given you a voice that amplifies beyond the power of a microphone. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and he didn't miss it. No, he didn't miss it. <laughs> Amen. They stopped paying attention. They had seen Jesus right before their face. Riding in on a donkey, just like Zechariah 9, 450, 500 years earlier had been prophesied. Right in front of their face. They missed it. And the next thing you know, they're shouting, crucify him. Crucify him. This is why Jesus was weeping when he was riding into Jerusalem. He wasn't weeping because he was about to go experience death. That would be a reason to weep. He was about to go experience your sin and my sin, all sin upon him. The heaviness that he must have felt. That's not why he was weeping. He was weeping because he knew that all those who were celebrating him and saying, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, laying down palm trees or palm leaves and clothes and everything as he processes into the city. He knew that a few days later, they'd give him over to be crucified. That they would miss it. He was the answer to the peace they had been asking for. And they missed it. So family of God, this is Holy Week. What a time to seek the Lord like never before in your life. What a time to finally put down, put aside, push away whatever it is that might cause you to miss what the living God has for you. Go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. And many of us in this room had a moment you can think I can think of the date I can think of the time when I fell to my knees weeping overcome with the power of the Holy Spirit the, the comfort of the Holy Spirit and I said Jesus I just give it all to you I didn't that was a very clear call in my face and I said yes Lord I accept you as my Lord and Savior I want to walk out life with you not without you I don't want to miss it I can remember the time the date where I was and many of us have that same experience and there might be some of you in here it might be the first time in church or first time back in many years a long time and everything in between and I want to ask you, if you've never given your heart to the Lord and you said, I welcome you into my life, I make you Lord of my life, thank you that you loved me, Jesus, and now I'm ready to love you. I can't do it on my own, and I want all that you have because I don't want to miss it. If you're in here and you've never put your yes on the table, never drawn a line in the sand and said yes to Jesus, if you've never done that, um, we're going to invite you into We're going to all say this prayer together in a moment. But I invite you to say that prayer together with us. And if that's you, if you want a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're, you're turning away from the world. You're like, I don't want to miss the signs. I don't want to be distracted away from my purpose. And I'm ready to invite him into my life. If that's you and you're sitting in this room today, would you quickly just raise your hand up in the air and you're just saying, Lord, yes, that's me. Go ahead, just quick, quick hand. Amen. There's, see those hands. Awesome. Beautiful. Love it. That's beautiful. Go ahead and put your hands down. Amen. I love, and I, I love to say this as many times as I can, that, that our Creator, the God who created it all, the, our Father in Heaven, His plan is to reconcile every single one of His sons and daughters back unto Him so that we can walk with Him, talk with Him, commune with Him, and we can be led by Him in our purpose. How beautiful is that? 
Thank you all for raising your hands. I have one more question. Maybe you've, you can remember that moment you came to Christ, and, and you can remember like I can, clearly, whether it was in a church, at home, wherever it may be, in a car, and you started going to church, you started seeking God, you experienced His goodness, His faithfulness, but you've been walking further and further away from Him. Maybe you've been led astray, you've been going a different direction, you've been trying to do it all on your own, knowing you can't, but something is just steering you away. If that's you here today, I invite you to say yes now. Say yes again. Put your yes on the table. Don't miss it. What a time to come back and go all in with the Lord. Holy week as we approach celebrating resurrection. So if that's you, you're saying, you know what? I'm coming back to the Lord. I'm putting my yes on the table. I'm done with the world and I want to live for Jesus. Go ahead. Just raise your hand. If that's you, you're coming back to the Lord. Amen. I see those hands. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Go ahead and put your hands down. So church, you know, we say this together as a reminder. And if this is your first time saying it, saying it, say this prayer, repeat after me, say this prayer together as we are reminded, number one, but number two, if this is your first time, say this like you mean it. Really pay attention to what you're saying as the Holy Spirit is moving in this place. So church, would you repeat after me? Say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I believe it in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord, that you died for my sins, that you rose from the dead, and that you are seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. Thank you for calling me out, calling me up, calling me in to relationship with you. Thank you for not allowing me to miss it. I give my life to you. Lead me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. My heart, my prayer is that you are encouraged today and maybe redirected toward the Lord. And, and I say this again, I'm not kidding when I had a moment of clarity with the Lord, when I say I had a moment of clarity with the Lord, and he said, you have to tell them, don't miss it. You have to tell them, don't miss it. He said to me, Nick, don't miss it. And so I encourage you to seek the, this is Holy Week, family. We're entering into a fast, some of the leaders, we're fasting this week. For souls, we're fasting for ourselves, for our families, but we're also fasting for souls. I encourage you to join us. Seek the Lord and what that looks like. Dive in like never before so that you don't miss it, family. It's coming at us faster than we're ready for it. But if we are standing firm on that firm foundation, we will be ready for it. And like I said, the remnant church will rise, the remnant church will sustain, and the remnant church will thrive. What an honor to be called for such a time as this. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. And we're going to sing Hosanna again. But I want you to sing it differently this time. Don't sing it like the Israelites, like the religious teachers of that time, the disciples of the time who sang it, sang Hosanna, but then a few days later said crucify him. No. Let's sing Hosanna, which means save us, which means thank you for salvation. Let's sing it like we know it, like we mean it, like we've put our yes on the table. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you for eternal life. And family, this is, many of you put your yes on the table or back on the table, if you will, today. And I encourage you, we have prayer available to you, a prayer team in this corner and that corner, ready to pray for you. They've been interceding for you already. Anytime during this next song, please step out of your seat, receive prayer. If you said that prayer for the first time, or if you rededicated your life to Jesus, please see one of our prayer team members. They would love to pray for you, pray over you, and stand in agreement for what you're believing God for. Prayer is an important part of not missing it. It's an important part of walking with the Lord. Amen. So please, if you feel that tug in your heart anytime 
during this next song, please receive prayer any side of the sanctuary. They'll stay after for you as well. We are here to pray for you and pray with you. Amen. Let's go ahead and lift a hand to heaven before we worship. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you that your joy is our strength. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for speaking. Thank you for leading. Thank you for guiding. Thank you that you're right here before us, Lord. Give us eyes to see, our ears to hear, and a heart open so that we don't miss it, so that we walk with you, Lord. And the ripple effect of what you're doing right here will build your kingdom, will bring many to you, will bring many more, hundreds, thousands, will exalt the name of Jesus, the name of at which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And today as we sing Hosanna, Lord God, we exalt your name above anything and all things in our life. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Hosanna. 